What's going on everyone? Today we have a very exciting video to shed light on PGY2s in pharmacy informatics. And we have a very special guest, Ben Anderson. He is an RPD of a PGY2 pharmacy informatics program. And he's gonna shed some light on this topic. And we're going to actually have Ben uh, give a short introduction of himself and kind of where he did his training. So, okay. Well, thank you for having me, Brian. Uh, I completed my undergrad at the University of St. Thomas and got a BA in biology. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, I went to the University of Minnesota. I was on their Duluth campus, and I was actually part of the inaugural class oh. that graduated from up there. So that kind of uh, being a pioneer, or guinea pigs as we called ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, gave us some interesting learning opportunities as pharmacy students along the way. Uh, after I completed my time there, I went out to UPMC in Pittsburgh for two years and did a combined health system pharmacy administration residency. And in that time, I also got a master's of public health mm. because residency is not busy enough. <laughs> so uh, we like to put the degree programs in with those experiences as well. Okay, very nice. I like the master's in public health part because yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's good. Very busy, busy uh, year for you must have been with, with that. Um, let's, let's jump into the questions then. Sounds good. So we'll start off with a couple of general questions, and it's always interesting to get you know thoughts from various pharmacists who work in the informatics field. So what are your thoughts right now about you know the current supply and demand of informatics pharmacists in the United States? I think right now, from what I've seen, the supply is looking good. Mm. Um, I think it's helpful. It's growing. We're getting a little bit more robust training, mm -hmm. um, and I've been around long enough. It's been nice to see the evolution being from pharmacist to maybe we're a little bit clinical, maybe more out of the central pharmacy, raising their hands in a staff meeting mm -hmm. and volunteering to help with, let's say, an automation project. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they just kept doing that kind of work um, and became some of our more veteran informatics pharmacists that we may work with today. Mm -hmm. um, to really watch that change and become a formalized, structured process um, over the last several years has been very interesting. Um, and the reason I say I think we're okay is at least with um, my group of peers and folks I talk to or maybe looking to transition or move around, um, there's not always an abundance of opportunities where they're looking to go. Hmm. So to me, that kind of states it's not in a dire need. Okay. Um, but I can definitely see it still growing and improving on itself. That's interesting. So, so just to add on to that that um, response, um, if someone came out, you know, fresh from a PGY two in informatics, or you know, they've had a couple years of informatics, do you think that the general demand is not high? Then maybe just like kind of moderate, because we do have a lot of supply. Is what you're thinking? I think it would fall more into that area. Moderate. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Yeah, um, and, in, and again, part of that too is just based on uh, the circle of people I know mm. and a lot of times, I mean, think about your own team. I know you've been in a current role for a little while now. Mm -hmm. um, even with a larger team, we don't have an excessive amount of turnover. That's very when true. When you really stop and think about it compared to our clinical colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do st tend to stay in the <laughs> our positions. Okay, that's very fair. Um, now let's let's talk about um, individuals that are wanting to do this PGY2 in pharmacy informatics. They're going to invest another year in this <laughs> residency pathway. What kind of you know knowledge or skill sets can one expect to gain? You know, at a very high level, what 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 would it change if they invested their time in doing one? Uh, I would say some very applicable things that would even help you if you had a change of mind and maybe stayed on the clinical side. Uh, project management, mm. I think, is a big thing that gets maybe overlooked or a little downplayed early on in all of our careers, mm -hmm. oh, um, yeah. is really understanding how those processes work and things to think about. Um, our day isn't just simply, hey, this is broken. <laughs> oh, hey, I'll fix that for you, and then yeah. I move on. Uh, there's always a lot more pieces to think about uh, to help work with that. Um, Time management, and again, not a 
not necessarily a specific way to manage it, but understanding what works for you, um, really to help gauge bandwidth with projects and requests and things on your plate. Mm -hmm. um, also learning to be kind of a open communicator more toward negotiating. Uh, I look at a lot of the work we do. Uh, we're often negotiating our own times, our own time amongst ourselves and with our leadership and our teammates mm -hmm. to make sure nobody's getting buried <laughs> under too much responsibility yep. why other people may be looking for some other things they could be helping with. Um, so all of those things are skills I think you can work on during the end of pharmacy school and during a PGY-1 uh, in more of a broad sense uh, to help get ready for a PGY-2 year. Okay. Um, and they would especially transfer themselves nicely to the informatics world. So those are great, great ones. Project management, time management, and then communication. Right? Fantastic skills. Um, okay, let's, let's move on to um, a question that I actually get quite often from students that are looking to do a PGY-2, and that's about um, unaccredited PGY-2s, or I just guess unaccredited residencies. But for this context, we're just talking about unaccredited pharmacy informatics PGY-2s. So, you know, this is somewhat of a relatively new field, you know, compared to like other pharmacy fields. You know, there's PGY-2s for informatics that's just now starting to spring up. I feel like we find new ones all the time now. But because of that, you see a lot of these as unaccredited but some, sometimes they've been around for a couple of years and they're still unaccredited. So the concern from students are typically, should I go to one of these if they're unaccredited? Whether it's new or whether it's been around for a while. So what, what are your thoughts on that? And if they went, does it impact their job outlook? That's the main concern. Yeah, uh, I think for me, and I've always been a big ASHP advocate, so mm. I, would, I would like to see more things accredited, more things in the framework having people come out with kind of a known quantity of learning and boxes checked and experiences offered. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that accreditation framework kind of offers that. Uh, but some of the things to probably ask about is, is this a program that's looking to be accredited? Are they in a candidate status? Did their process just get delayed due to unforeseen circumstances? Mm -hmm. Sometimes life happens mm -hmm. and those kind of things could be put on hold. Other things, um, perhaps I know some of these programs have started up out of necessity where the institution uses it almost like a feeder system to internally train and retain their mm -hmm. own staff of informatics pharmacists. So maybe that's why they haven't sought an accreditation yet or found the value of putting in that work. Maybe their plan is essentially to recruit and retain these folks for a handful of years out of the program. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, you've tacked on two, three, four years of experience anyway. Yeah. So I see that as far less of a detriment to any long-term opportunities within the field. Oh yeah, definitely good if you're looking to get a job right mm -hmm. after, if that's the purpose. Yeah, and then the other good things to always ask like that is if it's been those couple of years like you mentioned is, where are your current residents that have finished your program? Mm. Where did they end up? Did they end up places where you might have thought, oh, wow, somebody <laughs> who did an unaccredited program got in there? Yeah. Okay. okay. They must have, had, must have come out of here with an okay skill set. Yeah. And so kind of probe and ask those questions as well. I think that's a really, really good point there because I think not, not even just pharmacy informatics residencies, but any residency asking where they're graduate or residence <laughs> went, did they don't go jobless or switch career? Yep. <laughs> or did they go to somewhere that was great? You know, I think that's a fantastic point. Um, okay, so that was kind of like some of the more general questions. Now let's talk about what's really on your mind <laughs> when you're interviewing these candidates. And we will um, start off with uh, your perspectives on the type of knowledge skills and experiences that a candidate has like what are you looking for when you're interviewing a candidate whether it's a pps a phone interview on-site interview like what are you trying to gauge when you're interviewing these candidates i would say for the knowledge um, 
we can kind of tell if they've got a good grasp of some of the concepts and terminologies, mm. like more the level of things you could pick up on your own because this is something of interest to you. Uh, for the experiences, I personally try to look at any experiences only in a positive light uh, because I'm very cognizant of the fact that as a student, depending on where your college or school of pharmacy is, and as a PGY1, depending on the size and the strengths and sometimes the organizational structure of your institution, mm -hmm. you might not have good access to informatics okay. or to the right yeah. people. So I never feel like that should be held against anyone interested in the field. Uh, but those who are able to find and get these experiences and gain those opportunities by seeking them out, um, that shows great initiative mm -hmm. um, and that shows a different level of desire to actually be pursuing this as a specialty. Okay. No, that that's actually a good point. I never thought about that. Um, definitely don't want to hold it against them if their their pharmacy school or their residency experiences didn't give them those kind of uh, opportunities. Um, so it sounds like you're more judging for or you're looking for personality or fit in that sense. You know, you're not looking at what they've done, but um, kind of how they might fit with the organization and kind of research on their own because your general knowledge of terminology, you know, if they've yeah. done their own research. Correct. That's exactly right. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a wonderful, diverse group of preceptors. Um, and so that fit is something we've all kind of gotten on the same page mm -hmm. about. Um, and we want to make sure that what we're really finding out is that we kind of fully pull back the curtain on how we run our program and how that year will look for that resident mm -hmm. to make sure they even want to invest the time to apply with us. Okay. And then if they come on site, that they have enough time with all of the preceptors that they'll spend a substantial amount of time with during the course of the year and make sure this is a place that they feel like they're going to be able to dive into the deep end and really just grasp the opportunities and the learning experiences with those preceptors. Okay. And uh, I was just thinking, you know, a lot of us that have gone through residency understand this concept of fit, you know, but for those who might be newer, like, you know, they might be P1 or P2s that are watching the video, they're like, what is fit? Like, <laughs> you know, so if, if you were to kind of elaborate on fit, you know, what would you kind of say a resident fits or doesn't fit? And then the second part is, um, to this question in general is, do you look for different things at mid-year, you know, like maybe at PPS versus after mid-year, you know, you you invited them to an interview. Like, are, are there any differences you look for? So kind of yeah. two questions. So the first part with fit, I would say that's when you're in there and what you're trying to understand is kind of those personality types mm. of the people you're interviewing with. Um, ask them how they like to teach. So when you're interviewing, uh, make sure those preceptors you're spending time with that how you like to learn is how they like to teach, or at least there's a good overlap of that. Mm -hmm. You're not always gonna find everything you want, but that's something I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. And other personality traits, do you have a whole lot of, I know this sounds weird in our field, but are there a lot of extroverted <laughs> preceptors? Uh -huh. Are they more introverted? Do okay. you feel like just day-to-day -day conversations are gonna go well with them? Yeah. Um, and so it, it might seem like they're almost a little superficial things, uh, but in reality, you're spending a lot of hours every day for 12 months with these people. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you leave with that good feeling of, I really think I'll enjoy learning from them. And I think on our side, we kind of do the same thing. That's one of the things we kind of heavily look at. It's like, we really feel we can teach this person and we can help them get everything they want out of this year. Yeah. And we can help them be the best informatics pharmacist they can be after they've spent the year with us. Okay. And then I think for your second part, kind of to that end of fit, um, our real difference between what we do at mid-year and what we do once someone comes on site is I really spend about 80, 85% of the time at mid-year, really laying out the program, what your year looks like, how we like to teach, 
uh, how we grasp different opportunities as they present themselves. So our program is uh, very fluid, as I'm sure you've noticed with our residents that have come through over mm -hmm. the years. And I'd like to make that very clear because that kind of loose style and fluidity doesn't fit how everyone likes to be taught. Yeah. Um, some people are very happy with this four weeks, this four weeks, <laughs> this four weeks. Structure. And that activity. structure, and that's yeah. perfectly fine, and those programs exist. But I like to be very clear with that up front that that's not quite how we do things. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's another thing to think about with that fit is just by looking at the rotations offered and how your years laid out does that type of either block learning or more project learning fit how you take information in in a manner that you'll think you'll be able to reapply it down the road. I'm sorry, I wanted to plug this butt in so bad. <laughs> the whole time I was thinking about fit. So fit is, you, you know, we, we just talked, well, you talked about it quite a bit, and I think it's a great uh, description or definition of fit. It's almost synonymous with, like, chemistry. Like, how much chemistry have someone? Yeah. But you would expect pharmacy students to be good at chemistry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyways, um, no, that's great. So it sounds like the PPS session is more informational, you know, at least um, for you. And then on-site interview is more of your gauging, like that fit and all that. Well, not really. PPS more informational, less your typical traditional interview where you're grilling a candidate. Correct. And then the on-site's probably more, you know, formal. Yeah, and how, just kind of high level how we like to structure that time is uh, at least a half hour, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on the preceptor, uh, with each of our preceptors. So we give that candidates some one-on-one -on -one time to get to know everybody and then we also do some kind of routine expected interviewing questions mm -hmm. as well as the presentation so we kind of feel across all of that and kind of powwowing with everyone after uh, that we get a pretty good picture about um, what we can offer that candidate and what that candidate will bring to the program okay very good these are excellent points that I'm sure everyone's gonna just, just grab onto here. So how, how about this? We, we talked a lot, a lot about what you're you know, looking for. We have fit on the table. We have you know, general knowledge of terminology, um, things like that. So if you were to you know, give some tips or advice to students, whether or not, whether they are P1, P2, P3, anytime in their pharmacy school, or if they're PGY1, what kind of tips would you give to them to obtain that kind of knowledge or um, skills or any experiences potentially? I would say probably first looking out at ASHP in the section of Pharmacy Informatics Technology, Information Technology, mm -hmm. um, kind of accessing that. There's a lot of great tools and resources there. Um, I know a few years back there was the eHIT Collaborative that I believe you oh, yeah. brought to my attention. Um, that's just some great kind of bite size. Information. quick yep. digestible things that give you a good and a cursory understanding of a lot of areas um, the bigger things would be if you don't have the access talk to those folks at your school of pharmacy who help with mm. that curriculum kind of push to help get that developed or introduced or intertwined um, a lot of informatics doesn't live out in a bubble <laughs> so it can be kind of easy to put little sprinklings of it on other things and just yep. make it a point of emphasis with other things that are already being taught. Uh, same thing with a PGY one year. Um, get familiar, settle in. If you think this is an area of interest, be up front with that RPD mm -hmm. or that assistant RPD right away and stress that you'd like some of these opportunities. See what those channels are. Like I said, sometimes it's not the size of the project you got to be involved with. Uh, it's the fact that who you're interviewing with will see that your site maybe didn't have anything to offer, but you took that initiative to find things, mm -hmm. to seek out that learning. Uh, and I think in our field, since we're constantly learning new things almost yeah. every day, uh, that seeing that even though you're still in that student mindset and that resident mindset to me, that should make it all that much easier. Mm -hmm. That's what most of your time's devoted to right then is learning and finding those opportunities. 
So my, my key kind of summary based on all that is like a lot of initiative. You know, you want to see that they took the initiative to maybe get a certification or took the initiative to research what e-hit was, you know, things like that, or just basic terminology. So that, that's, that's good. So that kind of gauges a lot right there. Okay, so last two questions, um, and this should be interesting. And we're going to talk about, you know, one positive impression and one negative impression. We'll start with the positive. I, actually, we should start with negative and, and on a positive note. So a negative uh, impression is like, you know, throughout your time as RPD, what kind of one or two examples of negative things have you encountered that you would say, hey, hey you should probably not do this during an interview um, that, you know, kind of you remember? Yeah, and I think for me, and this isn't so much a, a specific thing that happens, it's kind of a, an attitude a candidate could have. Mm. And again, going back to the fact that informatics and technology itself is so broad and expansive, mm -hmm. uh, it just makes me a little wary when a candidate is exceptionally overconfident with their grasp mm -hmm. of skill sets in certain areas. Because I know for myself, <coughs> doing this for I think eight plus years now, Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel I have this amazing, I comprehend this fully grasp on too many areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm comfortable and efficient and effective in what I do, but I always know there's another layer to peel back. Yeah. And there's still always problems that come up that I need to do more learning, even in those areas where I spend a lot of my time. Yeah. Um, so I'm always just a little hesitant personally when I'm talking to those folks who convey that level of certainty with their skill sets. So that, that kind of arrogance, you kind of, you know, overconfidence. Okay. A little bit, yeah. Okay, so. And so that, and, and to me, uh, I think that's something that you can, you can personally work on or mm -hmm. you can ask your friends about, do I, do I come off like <laughs> this when we talk about things? Yeah. Because to me, that's something that bleeds bleeds over into all aspects that's not just a it's not just an interviewing trait absolutely that comes up so that's just something to be cautious about okay because you can very easily just change some words and how you're conveying your comfort level mm -hmm. let's say with an office suite of tools or excel or statistics and what i know it's very easy to tone down the language you're using uh, to still get across what you want Absolutely. And, and make that point that uh, I've had a lot of experience with Excel. And I, I absolutely agree because I always preach that you should be humble as much as you can. You don't want to be overly confident and arrogant in any kind of way. So goes a long ways to not, <laughs> not do that. Okay, so that's the negative. Let's talk about a positive. You know, what, what, have, what kind of experiences have impressed you, you know, since you've been RPD? Uh, and it, again, I don't think it's a specific experience that I remember hearing from mm -hmm. a candidate, but it's almost a kind of a tone of excitement mm -hmm. when they're telling you about what they've been able to do so far or after they hear the program overview, mm -hmm. what they're interested in hearing more about in those follow-up questions. Like I can generally capture that like pure sense of excitement and engagement yeah. okay. that this really is something they have a desire to learn more about and to work in this field okay. and so to me actually hearing that because again um, unlike what we just talked about where you can you can work that you can get that out of your interview vernacular you can change some of your words yeah. uh, be a little bit more humble as you said uh -huh. um, you really can't fake that excitement <laughs> and that eyes lighting up feeling yeah i mean that's like kid in a candy store type stuff yeah. when you see it you know it yeah and so that's one of the little things i look for too is that kind of genuine engagement that they're going to be excited to be learning and doing these kind of things for the year with us okay those are great great tips both of those both the negative and positive and just out of my curiosity um do you see more or less that kind of, you know, when you're interviewing candidates, do you see more or less of that 
negative kind of trait or more positive kind of trait? I definitely run across the positive more so. a lot more. more. Uh, oh, that's good. It, yeah, it, it's honestly been maybe once a year I get a little bit of that. What I, what I mentioned is that kind of hubris. Yeah, and and again, I think that's something with my my training background and me personally mm-hmm. that I look for a little differently than other people might. Okay, but yeah, I definitely see uh, more and more that that sense of engagement and the genuine interest on what we do in pharmacy informatics come through during interviews. Okay, well. That was a lot of great information, you know, and, you know, thank you for taking the time because I know you got to run home, yep. the kiddos, you're a busy guy. <laughs> so thank you for, you know, just talking to me, answering the questions, and I'm sure a lot of students will appreciate it. Uh, if you guys have questions for Ben, well, what's the best way of contacting you? I'm going to leave Ben's contact below in this description, you know, LinkedIn, email, what's the best contact? for you uh probably just go with the linkedin linkedin okay we'll leave your linkedin on the bottom of the description below and then uh yeah that's a wrap for the video we'll see you guys next time hey guys thanks for tuning in and watching the video if you like the content definitely hit the impro rx button over to your left to subscribe and definitely check out more videos over here uh to your right now As always, if you have questions, comments, and even better, suggestions for future videos, definitely let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, until next time, guys.